Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Harland and Wolf Group Holdings PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so, and these will be available via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, and I would now like to hand you over to CEO John Wood. Good afternoon, sir. Perfect. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and it's great to be here and great to see everybody again. And as as usual, we've got uh, a lot of interest, so hopefully we can work through the slide deck, um, give everybody an update, and uh, then work through the questions that we've got. We've already got some questions that, that have come in prior to the, the, the webinar, so we can go through them, and then any questions that come in live, we'll do our best to deal with them as we go through the process. Um, I've got Arun Rahman here, a CFO, um, so any questions that I think Arun's more able to answer than I am, I'll refer the questions to Arun and probably vice versa for questions that Arun may have. So that will be fairly interactive between the two of us. So without further ado, we, we'll get started um, on the slides. So for those of you that don't know the company, um, Harland & Wolf Group Holdings PLC is made up um, of Harland & Wolf. Um, then underneath Harland & Wolf, we've got four sites, delivery centres as we call them based in Belfast, Appledore, Methil and Arnish um, is the main business. Then on the, the sub side of that, we've got Island McGee Energy, which is our gas storage project um, in Island McGee that I'll speak about in more detail shortly because we've had some great development and some really uh, transformational news um, as a result of the judicial review. So we'll come to that um, as we move on. Um, so when you look at the, the history of the business, from starting out back before um, Arun and I arrived back in 2010 to 17, the Island McGee concept arrived, it was developed. We then moved on and, and knocked out the Island McGee energy feed. And that was really to, to get that done so we could capitalize on the joint EU funding um, at the time, it, it, as it came to detail of a lot of the stuff that was meant to be done in the past around um, marine licensing hadn't been done. Um, we knew that was going to take some time to, to get to where we needed to get it to. Um, we decided with the ability to put work into Harland & Wolf and the ability to build Harland & Wolf in its own right, uh, we, we'd acquire the yard in Belfast, being only 12 miles from Island McGee from the, from the work site. We then went on after that to acquire our Harland & Wolf site delivery centre down in Appledore then we acquired the, the methyl assets um, up in Scotland in 2021, um, which gives us around 52% of the footprint for marine fabrication inside the UK, which as we go through the remaining slides, you'll see is a, a great position to be in at this moment in time. So if we look really at our markets and sectors, and it's probably worth just taking a few moments to, to talk through these. And rather than talking about the markets this this time first, I'm probably going to talk about the services. Um, and I think what we're offering to the market um, is a real complete life cycle management, starting from the, the technical design, that's the interior design, the technical drawings, the naval architecture, and your 3D modeling, work pack production, um, test and survey, and things like that, through to the the fabrication, that could be the fabrications of floating wind, it could be vessels, it could be barges, uh, bridges, um, nuclear components and things like that, all the way through to entire ships or parts of blocks of ships. Um, then through to repairs and maintenance, and that's the, the general type of maintenance that comes into the yard, uh, yards week on, week out. Then your in-service support, that's whether that's outfitting, whether it's mechanical, electrical, um, you know, welding, uh, systems, then moving through into the conversion um, arena. In the picture there, you can see a ship called Ceros um, that was in for a small conversion um, many years ago. Um, and again, that's one type of conversion, an FPSO, you, you can have many others through to decommissioning um, at the end of a project life cycle, which is up above. 
And I think the, the site in Belfast is one of the few facilities in the UK that actually has the EU certification for that. When you look across on the, on the left-hand side and we start looking at the markets that we're operating in, clearly defence is a market that we've done exceptionally well in, um, probably ahead of where we had estimated we would be, given we're you know, coming up to four years into a five-year plan. Um, defence was really going to kick in halfway through year three into year four, um, and we've clearly managed to bring that forward. Um, we've currently got the M55 project, which is was innovated to the Lithuanian um, government, which effectively is an export contract um, for us. We've then got the fleet solid support contract, which again um, is a large contract uh, that form parts of building the blocks for the fleet solid support contract and also integrating those blocks with the blocks from other yards that, that come in. The blocks for the ship will come in from, obviously, Spain, from the Navantia Yard, and from Harland & Wolf um, down in Appledore. When you look at the commercial market, and I think, sorry, just to finish up on defence, when you look at the, the projects going forward, there's various collaboration uh, between other defence yards um, in the UK, and there's other defence programmes. I think there's about nine um, defence or, or government um, contracts that we're currently looking at and currently tendering. So we see that market continuing to develop um, as time goes on. And one of the great things about that, it gives us a long lifeline, um, a seven years of backlog um, for that programme. Moving on to the commercial market, we've seen some real traction in that market in, in recent months and weeks. Uh, that really became Builds up. I mean, you've seen sunshine in the dried up recently. I know you're all avid lovers of the uh, the, the, the ship location um, app that shows you where the ships are and what ships are coming in. So you'll have seen that ship in again, um, a large contract that's come in. You, you've seen before that some of the other um, large ships. And it really shows that large docking capability. And I think the beauty about that Belfast dock is it can actually split into two, so we can have two different dry docks running simultaneously. I think energy, um, when we first looked at energy, it was really a little bit in the doldrums. And I think the reason for five markets is so that we can run with two of them flat at any one time. We thought energy was going to be a fairly flat market. But what we're seeing is a sudden realisation that renewables won't gift as quickly as everybody thought it would gift. So we, we've seen a lot of development in the energy space, new platforms, new new risers, <coughs> new new jackets, um, and we've seen a lot of elect, potential electrification work start to come through in that energy sector, along with existing assets requiring some substantial upgrade work to take them through the next phase of the journey until renewable kicks in. Um, Cruise and ferry, we've seen a change in that market post COVID. Um, obviously, a market that we thought would kick in a lot quicker for us, and I think defence has, has helped us out there a little bit. Um, cruise and ferry, we expected to be more buoyant. It's taken uh, a bit longer than we thought to settle in. However, what's happened with that market now since they've cancelled a lot of the new building orders and the new building orders are not coming through, and we don't believe they'll start re-emerging for another decade, we're starting to see really the uptake in that re repair conversion market. And again, the numerous inquiries we've got and tenders that we've got on the go at the moment um, really stand, stand that in, in good stead. So we see that as a market that will continue to increase. And then the ferry market, clearly, we, we, we're very well placed in that. And we continue to ca capitalise on that where we can. And really, rather than running the dry docks around the ferry market now, we're really running the dry docks around the larger cruise and conversion programmes and fitting the ferries um, in the downtime. And when we look at the final market renewables, we always said that it would be 2025 before we saw the renewable markets really kicking in. Um, we're beginning to see that ramp up um, as we speak, the number of inquiries, um, the number of projects that are live out there and the down select processes that are getting made. Um, and I think with a large capacity that we've got on the market, there will most definitely be a place for us to play. It's about picking the right contract, um, the right profile. And again, renewables doesn't just cover um, wind and static wind. It's wind, floating wind, onshore wind, 
it's SOVs, CTVs and the like. So I think, you know, you, you look at some of the contract um, obligations that have been done in Scotland, specifically um, around wind in the percentage of local content that has to be done um, in Scotland, we see a fairly large uptick in that renewable sector. And I think given the footprints that we've got, we're ideally placed um, to deal with that. So when you look at the, the, the real crown, uh, jewel in the crowns that we've got, um, really having the four yards is really key for us. But why is that so important? Well, you can join the four yards together to give a client the size of capacity and capability they want. We can also, you know, operate those yards independently. If any one yard's behind in schedule or lacking labour, we can move um, labour or materials or, or um, production capacity around the yards. It really gives us a, a massive upside to be able to do that. We've got two of the largest dry docks in Europe. Um, and, you know, the total footprint of well above 350 acres um, with, with significant assets um, on, on the footprint. And I think, you know, we're only one of three yards, major yards, um, looking at shipbuilding streams for the MOD work. And I think we've got very strong relationships inside industry and inside government. And I think the one beauty about the maritime industry is it's really got bipartisan support across all political parties um, so it's a great place to be. Um, as you look across um, the government policies of regional growth, encouraging experts, again, you know, it, it's all things that we're in, in the right place um, at the right time. And I think the geographical spread that we've got for local content requirements, again, it, it is fantastic. And I think this revitalising the sovereign and commercial shipbuilding, repair, conversion and fabrication in the UK it is really something that we should all be proud of as we begin to get traction. And I appreciate the, the lost number um, that we published at the end of last year and again in, into our interims um, is a number that disappointed many. Um, look, I think it's a number that we've understood was coming. Um, we said we're a five-year journey. Um, we're into that five-year journey. You know, we've got numbers and guidance published that take us to the end of this year and the end of next year, which shows us um, getting to that 100 million at the end of this year and being in profit um, by the end of next year. Um, that guidance is still in a, a good, reliable place. And I think with the projects that we've already won and the projects that we've got coming through, it puts us in a very strong position um, to do that as we move forward. Um, looking at Isla McGee gas storage project, we obviously um, prevailed in the judicial review that, that we had recently. Uh, the applicants made five grounds uh, where they thought they had grounds to contest the award of the marine license. Each of the five grounds were rejected and they weren't rejected with no explanation. They were rejected, as I'm sure most of you have read the judgment, with a full explanation of why they were rejected. And overall, the, the judicial review has now been finished. Do we expect an appeal? Um, look, given the, the type of people who we're dealing with, you always have to expect an appeal. I think with the judgment that's there and the appeals process being fairly defined and them having to identify new grounds or additional grounds or actually say the legal judgment is wrong, um, you know, that that there's options, but we think those options um, are fairly limited. But, you know, we were at the mercy um, of the court to notify us if and when any application process is put in place. We do believe that will be, if there is one put in place, we do believe it will be very quickly um, brought before the courts and it will be a day process um, and the outcome will be known um, very shortly afterwards. In the meantime, we continue to work feverly um, on that project. And um, look, it's a project that we, we started off the business with. It's a project that's not been forgotten about. Clearly, a lot of conversations have been put on hold whilst we've been waiting on the uh, outcome. But the market, we, we have to be honest with ourselves, the market has changed significantly um, when we went into this judicial review process to when we've come out of it. Hydrogen is clearly, and alternative fuels have clearly now come into the fray. Uh, 
the stress on Northern Ireland's power scheme um, has also come under um, extreme scrutiny. And I think the general realisation that this project is the right project in the right place um, has been accepted by many and welcomed by many. And I think there's a real appetite now to crack on and get this project built. As a business, we, we've obviously got options of what we do with that. We're currently, I think, you know, we didn't have the outcome, the judicial review um, in the door any more than 10 minutes when the phone started ringing from interested parties, from major operating companies um, to potential partners and things like that. So there is an increased um, interest in the project. We're busy working through with each of those parties what that may or may not look like. We as a business have an open mind. We're also looking at other alternatives for the project, to funding it um, internally, um, to see what critical infrastructure funds from government may be available um, to allow us to build out the project ourselves, versus whether we you know, do a farm out of the project or a straight out sale. So we're looking at that and we believe you know, by the end of this year, into the end of quarter one, we'll have a really good idea um, of where we're going with that. And I think the market, given the, the changes in the market, we've certainly not seen any downside um, in the time since we've been going through the judicial review process. And I think there's been a few work streams continuing on whilst we've been going through that process. So we're well positioned um, to make good, good progress once we get moving. Um, for those of you that don't know what the project is, we've got 500 million um, cubic metres um, of gas storage potential. Currently, the planning and the licensing is around storing natural gas. Caverns like this have stored hydrogen um, in the past, and, and other facilities are getting developed to store hydrogen. And it was interesting speaking to Joe Kennedy in Belfast last week, who so gas salt caverns, gas and hydrogen storage is an absolute no-brainer. And he, he was a bit bemused why it had taken us so long um, with the protest movements to get to this stage of the process. Um, and he's got a, a whole load of investors he's bringing back over in a month with several of them looking to come and uh, find out more about our, our project in Isla McGee. Um, and I think, so, you know, you look at why do we need it? I think the graph on the, the left-hand side clearly tells you why you need it. When you look at the volume of, of gas um, in storage in the UK, um, where we've got just over 1%, when the rest of our European neighbours have got 20 to 30%, the war in Ukraine um, and, and the Russian sanctions clearly have had a, a major effect. And I think the other thing that came out of the the conference where we were up in Aberdeen the week before last was the resurgence of FSRU projects. Um, and I think we now have sight on probably about six FSRU projects that are, people are looking to develop um, given the, the lack of capacity of gas in getting gas into the UK markets. So that's something we're, we're clearly pursuing to see how we can fit in with these uh, other developers that are developing these projects. I think we always thought that would be the case. Um, we did look at a project on our own um, a few years ago, as I'm sure some of the long-term holders are know. We decided um, to step away from that, but it's interesting that that's now come back around. Um, when you look at the, the, the government traction in, in, in relation to hydrogen uh, and future fuels, um, in net zero, we're, we're really seeing a, a big traction in that. We're moving in the right direction. We're members of very, various consortiums that, that's dealing with that. Um, so we'll continue to pursue them as we go forward. So I think, you know, you, you look at the capacity, um, 19 days um, supplying the market at maximum capacity. Um, then if you look at the peak demand in Northern Ireland, um, you know, 60 days. So it's a project that can make a, a significant difference. So one of the things we're busy looking at the moment is milestones and producing a milestone plan that really gives us, sets out the next 12 months of this program. And we're looking to get that out once we uh, get clear on where the, the judicial review is and if there will be an appeal to that process six weeks, I believe, are in. Yes. So there's six weeks 
um, that we believe there is a window of opportunity to lodge an appeal. And I think let's see what any grounds of appeal may be at that time. Um, when you look at the, the, the business model that we've now got and where we've come from, I think you look at 2019 with nil revenue uh, going up to 2020, 2021, 22, 23 and 24. Um, scaling the business on this sort of size it has been fairly um, hard work. It's been a lot of effort to get from point A to point B. Um, and as they say, the early years of building a business like this are also the most challenging ones. You know, I think we've we've won business and we've delivered the business. Um, and I think that's key to proving the, the strategic plans. You know, we've reduced the risk profile wherever we could through the business and we've built a significant pipeline beyond 2024 right through to the, the, the 2030s. So we sort of know where that pipeline is and we continue to, to, to build that pipeline. And again, when you look at the backlog that we're continuing to build, um, we're continuing to build that backlog. And I think it's fairly major contracts. And I think once you've got major contracts underpinning your overhead structure, it really becomes an easier sell um, is that you know a majority of the overheads you're only paying for once, not every project is paying for the same overhead. When you look at the assets that we've got, they are you know the largest fabrication facilities in the UK. We've got this ability to really grow at scale. And I think Island McGee, we've got a strategic energy asset or we've got a capital exit which will invest more money back into the core business. So look, I think that's a decision we actually look forward to taking. Um, in the months ahead, because I think each outcome of that is fantastic news for the business, especially when you look at the way the energy markets have changed in the upsize and in what we believe Isla McGee Energy um, is worth to the company at this time. When you look at the where we are now, we've got firm foundations in place. You know, we've got every asset generating revenue. We've got an experienced board supported by a growing team. All the yards are well invested in, and you know the ramp up of personnel continues. And you know the thing is, we, we've always managed to get the number of people we need, and we'll continue to get as we go forward. We've always continued to to invest into our apprenticeship programs. We're nearly three hundred apprentices now um, coming into the business across um, all the year groups. Um, when you look at the the, the, the momentum, you know we're. As I said earlier, we're just coming up to year four of a five-year plan. Uh, we've developed that reputation from a client perspective of delivering on time and on budget. And, you know, we're growing that significant pipeline in all the verticals. But we're also growing that backlog of contracted work. So I think when you look at the, the key investment themes, you know, the, the, the significant expansion in the UK wind um, with minimum um, levels of local content, so we know some areas are talking 30, 35, 40% of local content, which can only be good for Harland and Wolf as we move forward. And I think, you know, there's a lot of political prerequisites. Um, and, you know, as long as we can compete um, on price within 30 to 40% of overseas markets, um, you know, we're still in the mix. It's not like if you can't meet the Asian price, you're out the door. And I think with the local content, even though it might not be the whole project, we know there's going to be a percentage of that project going to the UK and into UK markets. And to be fair, well, a lot of the renewed, renewable stuff, specifically the Scottish markets. So I think we really need to look after um, that Scottish entity that we've got going on up there at the moment and keep driving that. And I think when you look at shipbuilding, it's now a priority um, for the government. And I think the beauty, as I mentioned earlier, that's got bipartisan support across all political parties. And I think that will continue to grow as we uh, as we move forward. And I think, you know, whether we get a change of government in May next year, whether it's November, or if we continue on with the, the same government, we do not see any issues there. We think all the parties are doing the right thing, have the right idea. And I think, look, given that we had zero employees and we're up around that 1,000 employees, um, in the time that we've been here, that's big numbers of people um, that are that are earning a living and paying taxes. So we do have traction with inside government. And I think 
the, the government are keen, especially in the defence arena, to make sure that their risk is uh, mitigated across various different yards also. So I think you know we're, we're keen to get moving um, and look in those different areas. And I think when you look at margins, we're, we're still looking at those blended margins of between 24 and 27 percent. Um, and I think you know we, we carry on and we push on, and you know we are doing the right thing, and we're getting the customers telling us that they'll come back and they've had a great experience. So I think that customer piece comes first. Customer happy, customer will come back. The investment piece in the yard to make sure the investors are there. And then clearly we've got that focus on our share price, shareholder value that we then need to focus in on to make sure that comes. And I think as part of the five-year plan, we're starting to see the early shoots and the early signs of that coming through from where we got up to the end of 24 into 25. Arun, do you want to talk yeah. through the financial highlights? Good afternoon to all of you. Um, this is my section, really. The financial highlights for 23 going into 24 and a bit of background around what we are planning to do on the funding side of things within the group. Uh, we closed the June 30th numbers at about 25.3 million. We are on track uh, to meet the expected end of year number. Um, we do have backloading of that uh, revenue line towards Q3 and Q4, and that's primarily because of the fact that uh, FSS, for example, was contracted for in February, but the real work commenced only by May, June. So there is a bit of catching up to do. Um, a lot of um, the revenue comes out of a combination of, uh, of work in progress uh, on labor and also on procurement. Uh, the risk, as always, will be on procurement, uh, given that uh, these are defense contracts. So whilst we are up to speed with Ministry of Defense and with our client, uh, we always need to be mindful of the fact that there are a number of processes and steps that need to be taken to get the supply chain approved by Ministry of Defense, by the defense, uh, by other um, clients to make sure the procurement falls into place quickly and on time. Um, our, uh, our loss for the half year was at 15.93 million pounds. Um, we had a research note published uh, following our uh, half year results, uh, and those year end numbers are consistent with what we believe should come through at the end of the year. Uh, from net debt position, uh, we stood at about 88.5 million um, as of June 30th. Uh, you will recall uh, in March 2022, we signed a debt agreement with Riverstone Credit Partners, a green loan facility. It was for an initial 35 million pounds. Uh, that has been upscaled uh, over the year to 100 million pounds. That's now been fully drawn. Uh, the coupon sits at a software plus 9%. Um, from a 2024 uh, perspective, um, we, we we maintain our aspiration to get to 200 million pounds, uh, of which nearly 145 million has been contracted for already. Uh, we expect to close that gap by the end of the year uh, to be confident of reaching that number by the end of 2024. Um, we had um, announced to the market that it is our intention uh, to be EBITDA positive by the end of 2024. We believe we could achieve that with a small EBITDA uh, positive of a million pounds. Um, we will be increasing our debt position over the next 12 months. Our net debt will be 150 to 160 million pounds. Uh, and it's really a function of uh, of refinancing the Riverstone uh, debt out of the business and introducing a new facility which is underpinned by UK Export Finance. Uh, we have taken our time uh, to put that deal together. It is still very much in progress in a very mature advanced stage. Um, and we've taken that time primarily to bring that coupon down to sub 10%. Uh, we believe it is achievable. Uh, we believe we're in good shape there, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Um, from a CapEx point of view, um, you are all aware we have a £77 million CapEx spend primarily in Belfast and Appledore around FSS. Uh, £45 million will come in from the FSS program directly. The balance £32 million will come in from a variety of sources. The leveling up funding that's provided by uh, the Belfast City Council is one of the arenas we are looking at. Uh, we are uh, 
We are looking at a landlord contribution of around 10 million pounds that will come from Belfast Harbour Commissioners. There's more to do around the civils and buildings works. And we have some specialist equipment that we are buying uh, from the UK and from Europe. And these are typically financed by OEM asset financing. Most of the major OEMs have got their, their, their finance arms and we're looking at getting into long-term deals on OEM asset financing. That is the way we intend on plugging that gap between the 45 and the 77 of required CapEx for FSS. Um, let's talk about the proposed new debt facility. The target is to raise 200 million pounds of which the first 90 odd will go towards refinancing Riverstone. That will leave us with about 100 to 110 million pounds of additional working capital. Uh, it comes under what is known as an EDG facility, an export development guarantee facility. Um, it is not necessarily only for export. It is quite a wide ranging facility, i.e. it's allowed. We, we are allowed to use it for domestic working capital, for some capex as well, as well as for exports. So it's quite a wide range facility. Uh, we will be using this facility for our working capital into 2024 and also 2025. Any capex top up that's required for Belfast and Apollo will come in from that facility. Uh, and most importantly, as we grow larger in size, even our contracts will grow. And once you start hitting that 25, 30, 35 million pound contract levels, there is a requirement for performance bonds. So we'll be using that facility as collateral for our performance bonds as well. Um, we are now at that stage where we are moving from fringe lenders to mainstream lenders, typically high street banks. This facility will be 80% guaranteed by the UK export finance and we'll be using a 20% commercial tranche uh, for the unguaranteed secured portion. Um, this is extremely important for us, both from a shareholder perspective and from a group perspective, because it provides that 80% sovereign guarantee, which effectively drives down that coupon and de-risks the entire economics uh, of the loan. From an economics perspective, uh, we are looking at a coupon of sub 10%, which is a clear five to 6% uh, savings from the current economics. Um, the initial term is for three years with an extension option of a further two years. Current conversations are around a flat five-year uh, term with a five-year extension option. And as we said, uh, the coupon is, 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 is likely to be at the sub-10%. Thanks for that, Arun. And I think when you look at the hub in the Lithuania Navy export contract, it really opens up um, that UKEF, along with the other project, were recently announced between 1675, yeah. 1675 million for a project that will be coming at the yard next year in January. Um, again, that opens up that UKF arena quite nicely for us. And I think it's all about reducing um, that, that number. So I think when you look at some recent uh, initiatives that have been going on, um, we've opened up a serviced office in Miami, Aberdeen and Southampton um, with the guys that we've got out there. We've already had some significant progress on cruise ship riding crews. Um, and we've already got people working on shipyards and other shipyards. And that's really about really driving that in-service support piece. Aberdeen, um, you've heard quite a bit about with the um, introduction of the, the battery and our involvement with the Chandia to really get ourselves ahead of that game and have that ability to drive. And what all of these three options are is we're really starting to now drive work outside of the UK yards. And these are not great big offices. These are small offices with a few people in them that we can use to drive that local client interaction and we can use it to drive that specific area of the business. Then down in Southampton, when you look at the major cruise lines that are down there, that's really so we can provide a day-to-day -day touch point for cruise cruise companies for works that are coming up so we can be in the uh, in in the centre and in the thick of things as we move forward. Um, when you look at the I was a silly potential contract, clearly you'll have seen quite a bit in the, the news and in LinkedIn recently around that programme. Um, really quite simple. As of today, we've not heard anything from I was a silly, silly steamship group to say whether we have been successful or unsuccessful. 
um, in winning the bid that we had submitted to them. We have, however, seen their recent statement saying they're off to Vietnam to build vessels. I think I would say it's a long way to take your ship back to get guarantee work and get them repaired, but hey, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, look, where does our involvement come into this and why are we driving this quite heavily? Look, it simply comes down to the fact that the, the Isles of Scilly Council um, you know, have the, our application live on the table for levelling up funding, which they would like to use to build vessels that they will own the outcome of it through a special purpose vehicle, and then they'll have somebody operate those vessels at the end of that period. The I was a silly proposal now they have rejected the levelling up funding. The reason we believe they have rejected the levelling up funding is they want to own the vessels 100% themselves and not the council to own them. And they want the ability to set their own tariffs on the route and they want a, monopo a guaranteed monopoly on the route. So what we're trying to do is open up this programme to build the vessels um, in the UK. We are hopeful of announcement in due course that there will be a competition for services on, the, on this route, um, but we wait to see what happens. Um, we believe the ferries that we've designed uh, and proposed to put on this route are exceptional and we believe that, that, that what the islanders need, you know, from when this concept's come onto the, the scene, uh, we've had hundreds of phone calls and the switchboard here from islanders thanking us for, for taking an interest in, in trying to facilitate this route. What the islanders have also said is that, you know, if they end up in a situation where, you know, there's debt to be paid back of 50 million on, on two ferries, um, they'll never be able to leave the islands and they'll effectively be hostages on the islands if the fares go up like expected by three to five times. So I think look, there's not a lot formally to say at the moment. Um, I've just summarised what's already been in the news, uh, but we'll speak about that in due course as we move forward. Um, when we talk about green tugs, obviously we made the announcement fairly recently around the, the, the green tugs that we're looking at with a bespoke design with heavy duty battery technology, proven um, commercial technology. And look, when we look at the amount of money that we'll spend out to subcontractors towing elements of fleet solid support contract and towing the, the barges for Corrie um, around the UK, we see this option of having our own tug and then putting them out onto the, the spot market for subcontract is an area that we can save ourselves some substantial money and use the tugs as demonstrators for to show what can be built. And I think since we announced that project at Seawork several months ago, we've seen a, a humongous um, interest in the technology that we've put in place. And I think the, the, the announcement that came out last week with the development of the Chandia um, being the UK um, in service support in Ireland sales and service support for that technology really bodes well for the future. And I think when you move forward, you look at across all our markets and across all our ser sectors, there's a real demand for battery technology. And I think having one foot in the game so that you can actually really understand that so that when you're working on projects and you have some specialists that rely on a really bode well for the future, especially given that the Achandia batteries already have NATO and Navy certification, um, we see that as being a, a real bonus for us. So as I've mentioned, the in-service support is something we're really beginning to ramp up, and that's getting work outside the shipyards, getting engineering work, internal refurnishments outside the shipyards, and that's really to, to boost that other line of revenue. And I think it's actually to act as a catalyst having local people where the, the operators are to really drive work back into the shipyards also. You'll have heard last week during London International Shipping Week um, that we launched the, the UK as a, a global centre for cruise um, repair and upgrade, um, which again went down very well. We had several operators in the room along with um, shipyards, fabricators, um, the supply chain. So I think when you look at Belfast, all the ships that could and the market of cruise ships that could come in, 
Um, Belfast has probably around 90% of that market that only Belfast can take these ships. The other 10% can't fit in the other the other shipyards. Again, when you look at this heavy, large, ultra-large vessels, LNG, cryogenic experience, and then you know looking at shore power and green initiatives to get to net zero, um, you know we're, we're in a good position um, as we continue to move um, forward. So again, this is a slide that several several of you have seen before. Ultimately, our game is to create shareholder value and increase shareholder value. Um, we're as disappointed as everyone else at the, the share price. Um, we believe you know, the debt and securing the debt and actually announcing that will have a, a significant impact on that long-term position. I think the, the the piece that you know everybody seems to be panicking over it. Certainly, everybody I talk to is the, the there seems to be this myth that we're going to run out of money tomorrow. Um, if we'd been in a position where we're going to run out to money tomorrow, we would have probably done a debt deal um, six months ago at a higher interest rate to buy ourselves some time. I think the fact that we're quite comfortable with the position we're in at the moment and we're actually willing to run this through to get the best deal should give everybody a bit of confidence with the revenues that we've got coming in from the multiple projects that we're working on across Arnish, Methyl, Appledore and Belfast, that you know that there is cash flow and sensible cash flow and we've probably never been in a better position um, with the cash flow that's coming through the business than we are at the moment. So look, we're in a position where we, we're relatively relaxed. It's about getting the right deal because the right deal will really underpin the next stage of the growth that we're going on. So I think, look, from the day-to-day -day focus that we've got, it's really looking at the, the health, safety, quality and environmental um, key, key figures that we look at every week and every month to make sure we continue to, to show the relevant trend. It's really building up that pipe work and the backlog of works so contracted works, we want to see that backlog increasing month on month, even though we're, we're eating out of that backlog um, on a month by month basis. And I think that's just converting that backlog in, in, into revenue as we move forward. Um, deliver the new debt deal that I've mentioned, it's a substantially reduced costing. I think that is key and it's something both Arun and I are passionate about. It's not about just getting any old deal in to take the pressure off ourselves. It's about getting the right deal in for the future long term of the company um, rather than a knee jerk reaction. Um, it's continuing to hit milestones and baseline programs. Today, um, FSS, M55, every program we have, we're continuing to hit the dates of the program on the programs. Um, and again, it's keep driving that success as we go through. And it's continuing to reduce costs um, as a percentage of revenue in the business overall. And that's really keeping that close eye and the close attention to detail. And it's the, the improvement in productivity in the yards, um, or all the yards, and really you know, competing one yard off, off against the other yard when you're looking at productivity, for example, building quarry barges in Methyl and Belfast, it's really pitting the teams against each other to really improve productivity, which we've seen some great results over the over the time. And I think it's investing in that new plant and equipment and machinery in taking away some of the ridiculous costs we're paying in service and, and maintaining old plant and equipment. I think it's been realistic when we do need to replace stuff, actually taking a long-term view and replacing it. And I think when you look at some of the strategic things we're, we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think when you look at the teams that we've built, both in Arun's domain, and in my domain, we're really beginning to ramp up on the and have ramped up on the, the next tier and the tier under that and the tier under that, which is really allowing us to focus on some of these strategic goals that, that we need to kick. And I think it's this in-service support, so it's driving revenue outside the shipyard, so it's, it's splitting the portfolio up a little bit and splitting the risk up a little, little bit. It's focusing on the, the Scottish strategy and realising the opportunities that are there provided by this guarantee heed local content and really capitalise on that as we move forward. And I think that bit of renewed focus on energy and cruising ferry and really starting to build that piece of the business 
and I think it's the, the small network of offices to reduce costs and taking them out of larger, more expensive places, um, you know, like, like London. Let's not build heavy overhead in London. Let's keep the overhead in the smaller places to reduce costs, get close to clients, attract a larger talent pool at cheaper salaries um, as we go on. And I think it's continuing to build that Harland & Wolf brand globally. Um, and I think, you know, we're leading industry-wide engagement. And I think that could be seen last week with the, the, the specialist sector for crews. Uh, we chaired that session um, from an industry point of view to get that moving to the next level. So I think we're well positioned for the future. And if we we get all that right, then that's where we increase shareholder value. And I think that's something we are mindful of getting to. I think when you look at you know, where, where we're getting to and you look at the split in the markets, I think that the top graph here on the top, top right-hand side is saying where 2023 revenues are coming from. Every year, this revenue graph will change and it will get there. You look at the middle line, this is a contracted backlog of where we think we'll get to as we move along. Then I think up here on the top line, you've got what that total revenue number of where we expect it to be from 2023 to 2024. And I think we've taken out the 25, 26 and 27 um, because that's information that we've not announced to the market yet. But look, the general theme is we're trying to get to that 500 million. I think every single time what we've said our target is 500 million. And I think it's how quickly we can get to that level. We know the work's out there. We just need to keep it going. And I think when you look at the win ratio um, that we've got amongst the, the, the backlog that we've got and the weighted and the unweighted pipeline, we're seeing huge opportunity here to get to where we need to get to. So just in summary, um, FSS contract is providing substantial base load and secure, secure fund over the next five to seven years. Um, pipeline activity is strong. Um, you know, one of the things we have done recently is bought in a, uh, a director of strategic bids. They've come in from SNC Lavlin, and that's really to take our bids to that next level and really cut out some of the background noise and cut out some of the bids and really evaluate them before we start um, to make sure we increase that P1 ratio that, that we've got on the go at the moment. Um, as I mentioned, it's that substantial facility from UKF. Um, that we're looking to be finalised. And look, I hear everybody's frustration. You all don't go forward at going backwards to tell me how annoyed you are that it's drifted on. But trust me when I say the deal that we end up signing will be worth the wait. We, we've been working significantly on this and it will be a, a substantial reduction in the interest that we're paying. So I think it will be worth the wait. And I think once we get that in place and given the length and the duration of what that facility will be, it will be worth the wait in the long term and it will really underpin the business as we move forward. And I think, you know, we look at inflation. I think inflation, as we all know, has been a challenge. Um, I think we're protected on some areas, you know, like steel, we're protected from the, the upside. We actually quote steel rates now in every single bid that goes out the door. Um, you know, we're looking for inflation to, to drop as we move forward. Um, and I think, you know, we're looking at more of a mixed blend of projects and really controlling that gross margin to make sure we keep that where we want it to be. And, you know, the company's backlog of, of contracted revenues now over that billion dollar, billion pounds for the next few years. Um, and I think we need to keep building that, as you saw on the graph, that continues to rise. Um, we're confident in achieving um, 2023. We're confident in achieving 2024, I think. You know, we should, as Arun mentioned, in the next few weeks, um, be able to nail 2024 to get to 140, sorry, 200 million. Um, and I think we're, we're already in a good place for that. And I think the longer we go on, the more projects that are beginning to come through. And I think, you know, we're well positioned for, for other wins. Um, but I think, you know, we just need to get that next few years done so we know where we, uh, where we get to. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening in. Um, happy to take uh, questions. Um,
John, Arun, thank you very much indeed for your presentation this afternoon. If I may just jump back in there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Um, guys, we did receive a number of pre-submitted questions ahead of today's event. And as you can see there in the Q&A tab, We've also received a number of questions throughout your presentation this afternoon as well. Um, so Arun, John, if I could just hand back to you just to make your way through those questions, uh, just give your responses where it's appropriate to do so, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you. Fantastic. Um... Sorry, uh, we're just deciding who was going to answer answer what question. So, look, I've got a, a pile of questions here that we, we got just as we came in um, of all the, the questions that has been pre-selected. And look, really, as I see, there's a, a bundle of questions on Island McGee. There's a bundle of questions on debt. Look, I think we've generally answered the majority of that, but there's probably a few bits and pieces specifically that, that we can go through on that. So we'll probably start with the questions that are on the right-hand side here first, Arun, and then we'll run through them, and then we'll revert back to this. Yep. Um, so if we start with the first question from um, Sam B, have you had any early scale early discussions with external parties regarding Island McGee? Um, look, Island McGee discussions have never ended. Um, there's been discussions going on all the way through. Um, we've had a fairly detailed um, conversation. We've got probably six, six serious parties that we're having discussions with, several others that I would say are less serious and more of the tyre kicker variety at the minute. Um, out of the six that we've got, look, they're, they're fairly serious discussions, but let's see where we get to. And I think the, the fact the phones were ringing on the same day that the judicial review came out really tells a bit of a story on that level of interest. So I think that's all I really want to say about that one. Um, if we then move down to some of the other questions, um, to meet the financial year 23 guidance in half two, you will need to make three quarters of the guidance figures in six months. What's the basis of your confidence that you will meet the guidance after last year? Arun, and I'm thinking that's our good friend Michael Vidal by the looks of it. It has. Hi, Michael. Good to see your question. Good to see your presence. Um, look, I think we have addressed that question in the previous slide. Ultimately, these are contracts that were signed, especially FSS, that were signed only in February. So you do have an element of backloading involved in it. When you look at the M55 program, we got uh, some significant bits of kit and equipment uh, at the end of the first quarter uh, of this year, and that flows into work in progress <coughs> towards the back end of this year again. <coughs> Typically, a cruise and ferry uh, market is extremely busy in Q4 and then Q1 of next year. So I think when you look at a combination of all these factors, um, there is an element of backloading uh, for this year. Now, what you will find over the next couple of years is that as we bulk up in our revenue volumes, as we have longer dated contracts, or multiple uh, contracts, that backloading um, skewing will disappear. It will be a lot more streamlined. But given where we are in our life cycle at the moment, you will tend to find a bit of backloading uh, towards, uh, towards Q3 and Q4, at least for this year and for the next year. And I think one of the other things you, you look at as well is the prudency and our accounting function. Yes. Um, when you're looking at recognize work in progress and whip and things like that. So there's certain things. Don't forget, we have an independent audit um, every year that goes through and, you know, really reviews and scrutinizes everything we do. Um, so I think, you know, some of the... The, the, the decisions we make are probably on the prudent side, I would say, Arun, at the Absolutely, moment. Yeah. So I think that that's where we are. Um, Michael, your second question is, why do you have no site presence, Wales, presence in Wales? Well, until I find something in Wales that I think is viable, um, then I'm not just going to go and invest in something for the sake of it. I think it has to be something that's sensible. It's something that you know we feel has to add value and has to really 
focus into what the core benefits of the business are? Um, Philip, uh, good afternoon. Good to see you um, on this uh, on this presentation on this forum. Uh, your question is the projected rise in debt to 155 million pounds looks very aggressive considering the projected rise in revenues to 200 million. Can you elaborate why? I think it's a function of a few things, uh, really, uh, Philip. One is we are going to be taking in a tranche of a large tranche of the 200 million pound facility, of which 90 is the first portion that gets that goes towards refinancing of Riverstone out of the business. The balance uh, 60 million will go towards working capital. Um, the debt that you see 155 is a combination of what we are going to take out of the line as well as our regular trade tables, etc. It might look aggressive, but the way we tend to look at it is, do we have the ability to keep the company going on a going concern sustainable basis? The answer is yes. Uh, do we have the cash uh, post this facility to invest in CapEx, uh, to grow this business beyond 25 and to have some meaningful levels of revenue growth in 25 and beyond? The answer is yes. On profit. And profitability. And dividends. Yeah. You know? So whilst it looks like an aggressive number, in reality, as soon as you start generating those kinds of revenue numbers, along with the margins that we think we'll get, followed by the next year to 2025, when renewables kicks in, that number will start shrinking. So it might look like a large number in the short term, but from medium to long term perspective, that will start declining uh, relative to our revenue growth. And I think when you look at it, it probably goes a stage further that you know, the, the 200 million, once you've reached that 200 million and you've got to, uh, you're making money, where this gets really interesting is the, the piece after that. Um, so I think, you know, you, you look at that, bearing in mind, we're looking at a five-year debt deal um, that I think Arun mentioned earlier. We're looking at this this stage of the, the growth. So I think, you know, we are, uh, we're, we're pushing on in the direction of where we think we can get the business to. And I think, the, the biggest hurdle for this is, has always been, was always going to be the first four years of this plan um, was always going to be hard work getting there. I think we're nearly at the end of that, that four years. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think for the first time in the company's history, we can actually see where the money's coming from. We can see where the contracts are coming from. We can see the pipeline. We can see the conversion, the pipeline into backlog. So I think, you know, we're in a position where we can actually see that route to 500 fairly clearly. Yeah. Um, Ray K has asked the question, are you confident you'll meet the 2023 value shares element of your LTIP? Um, the short answer is probably not, uh, Ray, given where we are uh, in the share price and where it needs to be over a 90-day period, which effectively kicks off from the 1st of October. Um, when we designed or when the Remco designed uh, the scheme, there was expectation of the FSS program uh, being executed. That's a big tick in the box. There was expectation of other contracts coming in. That too is a tick in the box. There was also expectation that would have closed the new debt facility uh, well before September. But clearly, it's a government process. Uh, we are... We are uh, dependent upon government uh, to complete their DD, to complete their processes. And that's taken longer than expected. And therefore, you do find that the share price continues to be depressed uh, till we have any meaningful information out to all of you around the debt facility. So the, the short answer is no, I do not think we'll meet the LTIP uh, number. Having said that, really, the focus is not about the LTIPs. The focus is about stabilizing the business creating that cash reserves on the balance sheet to grow this business into 24 and beyond. Absolutely. I think like the, the, the place where LTIPs will come into play is once we get this company humming where it needs to be humming, and that's once you get to that 200 million and above. That, that's where things will start to really take off for us. So will we in the future get to where we want to get to with LTIPs? Yes. Um, look, for me, it's... It's one of those things that, that, that sits out on the sideline at the moment. Let's see where we get to. I think we all know what we've got to do in the short term. So just looking at some of the other questions that came in, and these are all without names, so apologies if I don't mention names. Um, can further delays be caused, be ca can cause because of what protesters are saying, i.e. 
We are disappointed with today's judgment. However, the marine licence issue is just the first of many statutory consent required to deliver the project. Well, look, I think if you listen to the protesters, they would say they would have won the judicial review and there was no way they could have possibly lost the judicial review. Really, all they've succeeded in doing is costing all of us two years in time and been a pain in the neck. Um, and I think the fact that the judge threw out five out of five um, pieces points to the level of stuff we've been dealing with. Unfortunately, we just need to work through that and deal with it. We do not believe there is any other significant barriers that we need to pass. We believe that the last significant barrier was the marine licensing. licensing. So we, you know, we take it from there, we push on, we get to the next level. Um, but I think that we have to accept at some point, you know, that they're going to be still there. They're, they're not going to go away. You know, they're really keen. The fact that Northern Ireland needs this project to keep the lights on, whilst you know they uh, they don't seem to have the same concerns. Um, you know, they may be the privileged few that can afford substantially higher electricity bills. This project will provide the benefit for the the many rather than the isolated few. So I think look, we, we need to carry on what we're doing, abide by the law, and just get on with this project. Rune, you got anything yeah, else to say on that? Um, one for you, Rune. The credit facility deadline has moved a number of times this year, but still, is there still a risk that this could slide in Q1 of 24? Look, all indications at the moment suggest that this should close within the current financial year. Um, and we do hope that it will close. We are at quite a mature and advanced stage. Uh, we have term sheets from banks. We have uh, we have the structure of what the deal looks like. We have had fairly intense debates and conversations both with lenders and with the government on what the coupon is going to look like. We had a three to five month due diligence process conducted by a third party consultant um that, uh, that 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 caused many a sleepless nights uh for myself and my team um so on balance i do think that we are in a very good wicket having said that this is government that we're talking about a government process we need to ultimately bring together a number of counterparties that includes three to four banks plus the uk government uh, so whilst i think that uh, it's a difficult process it is certainly achievable uh, by the end of the financial year, not before. Perfect. Thanks for that, Arun. Um, when will the significant shareholders listing be updated, which still stands at 2020-02-23? Um, so the last TR ones that we received were in February 2023. We have had no TR ones uh, effective uh, thereafter. Um, we do run our own reports just to keep a track on if there is a massive change or not. There isn't a massive change, and clearly the advice from our nomad has been into the TR1 uh, <coughs> change upwards or downwards that is reportable. So we do keep our eyes and ears open for any tr ones that might come in, whether it's to us directly or through our nomad. But at the moment, there is no significant change to the TR1 list or to the, to the, to the major shareholders list. Um, can we take one last yeah, question? Yeah. Well, we've got a few. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. We have Dominic. Hi, Dominic. Uh, his question is, uh, is there any danger Riverstone won't agree to be to the refinancing and trigger massive dilution? Um, we don't believe so, uh, Dominic. If you look at Riverstone's investment mandate, they are an energy fund, both conventional and non-conventional energy. Uh, the whole desire to be refinanced out of the business stems to the fact that we are quite a defense-focused company in the short term. So I think we have kept them informed of the various conversations we've had with our lenders, future lenders and uh, the UK government, and we have a lot of support out of Riverstone. So to answer your question, I don't see this as a major risk. Okay. I'm going to try and get through a few of these fairly quickly um, so we go through it. Um, is there any firm customer commitment for electric tug and when will the first one be completed for company use? Since we announced this, as I said, there's, there's lots and lots of inquiries, solid inquiries for these tugs. Um, we're in detailed design at the moment, in detailed costing. We expect to cut steel early next year with a build time of around 12, 12 months plus. Given the first one of these tugs will be a first of class, I think we're allowing 15 months 
to get that through. It may be that if a customer comes along in the meantime and they want the first tug, it may be we sell the first tug to a client rather than use it as a demonstrator. Let, let's wait and see. But look, we're certainly keen to get on and build them. Um, any news, re HMS, Donor Craft, um, Athelston? Um, yes, there is. No, I don't want to talk about it. Um, question What is the estimated cost of debt in the next financial year? If you want, it's hard to. It's difficult to say at this yeah. moment. It depends when we, we change lenders and things like that. Um, what percentage of the 77 million refurbishment? Refurnishment is building versus machinery. We've already spoken about that. Um, what is the plan for Island McGee as a long-term investor? I expect the company to be prepared for a positive outcome of the judicial review and communicate to the market a fully drawn-out plan of each, each action to reach a fit. Comes around this so far have been shocking as a result of the market, and I think it goes on. There's a bit more. Do you want to take that one? Or? Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Look, I think we need to be realistic about Island McGee Energy uh, as, a, as, as, as a project. Whilst we have the license and permissions for gas storage, the world has fundamentally changed over the last 24 months. The way to look at this project is, is an initial gas storage project that's transitioning into hydrogen. Now, when you look at the counterparties that we have been speaking to, excluding government, um, it's a whole bunch of counterparties. Those who actually look at this project as a transition from nat gas to hydrogen, and therefore they start off with storage of nat gas followed by hydrogen storage. There are other counterparties who want to go straight to hydrogen. The dynamics of both the markets are completely different, although they will be aligned over the next decade or so. The engineering aspects of, of storing nat gas is quite different to that of hydrogen, especially on the above ground installations. The cabins remain the same. And these are the discussions that we are having with our counterparties in terms of what is it that they actually want to do with the project? How does it all get monetized slash commercialized over the course of the next 30 to 40 years? And that is the life of this project. And what is the capex that's required uh, from a nat gas only perspective, from a nat gas plus hydrogen perspective, and from a hydrogen perspective only. So these are complex conversations that we are having with counterparties. These investments run into hundreds of millions of pounds. This is not an overnight solution. So I think the realistic scenario is we need to go through these conversations, understand what the requirements mm. are, and ultimately do the right thing for the shareholders, whether it is a straight trade sale or it's a farm out, or for that matter, getting into a deal with the UK government as a strategic storage asset, all the options are on the table. And I think that comes on to one of the other questions here. Considering that your gas storage project needs more funding, will you now sell it and use the proceeds towards engineering and shipping business? We've, that decision has not been made and won't be no, made until we actually really understand what the, the possible is. Um, then another, I presume, um, that a sale of Island McGee is now in the cards to levy debt. No, that's not the case. I think there are two individual prospect projects and prospects. I think each of those prospects, the Island McGee project on its own, can add significant shareholder value, as can the rest of the business. So I think before we rush in and make any knee-jerk decisions, that this needs to be done right. So one last question off of the list, the popul pre-populated list. Why is progress in the Cody Barge's contract so slow? Five out of 22 so far, nine months into 2023. Well, clearly the client has a program where they want to receive barges. We deliver barges to the client's program. I mean, that's as Absolutely. S simple as you can put that. Um, we'll take one last question. This is from Tom. Hi, Tom. An RNS was released for the letter of intent, major vessel furbishment. Is this in the 145 bill recorded towards 2024? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and then one final other one. Oh, we like taking questions. Uh, I've just got another one here that I've seen. How can we apply for UKF funding if we don't export? Well, we do export. So, Right, I think that... this presentation i think we've come to the end of this presentation thank you very much for your time and your patience john 
Aaron, if I may just jump back in there and thank you very much indeed for taking all of those questions that came in from investors this afternoon. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended. Uh, just for you to review, uh, to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. And we'll publish all those responses out on the Investor Meet company platform. Um, but John, perhaps before really just looking to redirect those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing questions comments that would be great well look i think that the first thing is thank you everybody for the time that you, you've spent here tonight and i noticed from the, the online numbers that you, you, every time that we do one of these events significant numbers um increase increase and the more people that's here the, the, the more interest we've got you know we do appreciate the frustration we share some of the frustrations that there is but i think we need to look at the the, the clear facts of where we are and where we're going with the business. You know, we started off with zero backlog. We've built the business up. We've closed deals. We've got the business from point A to point B. You know, we said we'd win the judicial review. We'd won, we've won the judicial review. Um, so I think, look, there's not many things that we've, we've said would happen that hasn't happened. Yes, I agree, we've been late um, on some things and the timing of things haven't been exactly as we would have wished. For that, we apologise. Look, we think we're at the, the cusp now of we, we can see where we're going to, we can see where we're getting to. I think that we're in a really good place. I appreciate your patience. Um, and look, we appreciate the, the, the amount of frustration you've had. Stick with it. We think it will turn around and we think you'll be happy once you see the debt deal. And I, I know we've certainly put a hell of a lot of hours in to get in the right deal. And when it comes out, I hope you agree with us that it was was worth waiting for. So thank you very much. And uh, as usual, I look forward to seeing you all um, in due course when we're, we're out and about. Thanks, everybody. John, that's great. And thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This may take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Harland and Wolf Group Holdings PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good afternoon to you all.